Lots of people today like to use their smartphone as a general purpose signal generator. I don't. This is a Wavetech slash Rockland model 5500 programmable frequency synthesizer made in 1979. And I quote from the manual. Models 5100 and 5110 programmable frequency synthesizers provide spectrally pure 8-bit frequencies in 0.001 Hz steps from DC to 2 MHz. A patented direct digital synthesis technique is used to generate the 8-bit frequency directly from an internal crystal reference. So what kind of performance can we expect out of this 1970s bad boy futuristic digital frequency synthesizer? Well, uh, we've got a frequency range of 1 millihertz to uh, 2 megahertz. And we've got a noise level of minus 50 dB. And we've got a harmonic distortion of minus 45 decibels below the carrier. Well, the, the performance of a thing like this is obviously not going to be particularly impressive since we are, as you are about to find out, dealing with uh, uh, an entirely discrete design made out of logic gates. There is a reason for the size of this thing and there is a reason for the fan of it. So, without dwelling too much on the mediocre performance, let's just get inside, shall we? Right, so as you can see, this is an absolutely enormous rack mount case for a measly 2 MHz signal generator. And that becomes quite obvious once you remove the two screws from the back and... Uh, slip the cover off. Because when you get inside, you are greeted by no less than 111 logic gates and what must probably be the largest DA converter I've ever seen. Now I do have the manual for this thing very thankfully and I'm going to try and link that in down below if anyone's curious about the circuit topology of this thing because I frankly I'm not prepared to spend any amount of time reverse engineering this thing unless I really need to. Because, well, the manual's 129 pages long, and uh, pages 39 through 129 is schematics and troubleshooting. So I would have maybe half a lifetime's worth of work ahead of me if I tried to do that. However, well, I will go through the general build of this unit in a very mechanical sense. So it's obviously got uh, a free board construction with this uh, main board down here housing the major array of circuits. In the front here we have uh, an attenuator board which uh, is simply is controlled by the attenuator buttons in the front. It's just a heap of resistors on the back side of it which you can't really see. And over here to the left we have uh, the front panel scanning board which uh, uh, basically makes up the difference between this and the model 5110 which was uh, the same thing except without the front panel controls. In the back we have a power supply which is made up of no less than one power transformer, three 10,000 microfarad caps rectifying the bus for the three separate 5 volt rails and two 3000 microfarad caps regulating the plus minus 15 volt rail which are regulated by these large heap of fan cooled tier threes to the right. The load on these circuits is the main reason for this uh, rather rusty 230 volt uh, ball bearing fan which uh, certainly adds a bit of ambience to the use of this unit. And all the way over here to the right, we have the temperature com compensated uh, crystal oscillator, which is providing the 8 MHz internal frequency reference for this unit. 
You could actually option it up to come with a oven controlled oscillator, but uh, sadly this unit doesn't have that. And considering that the little transformer over there to the left is already supplying about 60 watts of power to this thing, I Frankly, I'm rather happy about that, since uh, since I can't imagine adding an oven to what essentially already is an oven would do the thermals much good. And further towards the front we have the actual digital to analog converter with its uh, sample memory ROM over there, as well as the output power amplifier and the low pass filter. This DAC is an 11-bit signed uh, converter, so it's basically a 10-bit converter which is running straight off of the 8 MHz coming out of the crystal over there and the low-pass filter is supposedly set to about 2.5 MHz. A curious thing about this construction, which a friend of mine actually pointed out to me, is that uh, since this is a direct digital converter, theoretically you could uh, replace this uh, ROM with anything you've programmed yourself and uh, make this device output any arbitrary waveform since uh, all it's essentially doing is uh, trying to accurately clock out different addresses from this memory to the DA converter. Which becomes really quite obvious when you take a look at the not very sophisticated block diagram of the unit, because this covers everything. You have your crystal oscillator here providing a reference, and the circuitry to allow yourself to use a separate reference if you so desire, and that takes up about one third of it. Then you have some sample generation logic, the frequency register, which is the ROM, going straight to the DAC, straight to the low pass filter, straight to the amp. And then you've just got some control stuff and switching and other goings on on the side over there. So there really isn't much to a unit like this. And that makes you not so surprised to find out that you today can get a unit with far superior performance in a little. 20 something pin QFN chip consuming about 11 milliwatts of power. You can literally stick this entire device into your smartphone if you so decide. But when it comes to proper nerdery, pff, this thing can just go home. You do not get individual loomed wires in your smartphone, and you don't get these beautiful little blue mod wires going along the board when they just couldn't fit enough traces onto the two layers of the board. Now one could argue that uh, these blue wires going everywhere are a bit bodgy, and I suppose there's a quite fair point in that. But uh, really, given the technology available, this thing was designed not in 1979, but in 1972. So they would have barely had CAD software available to them. And uh, to be frank, it really is quite populated already. And in order to fit all this discrete circuitry around here, I'm not one to give these guys a thumbs down on their design, quite the opposite. I think it's quite stunningly beautiful actually how they've even aligned all the circuits up in lines. Although I suppose they could probably have gotten away a bit more cleverly if they, if they made it look a bit more messy, but eh, that would kind of ruin the nerd appeal, wouldn't it? And around the front there really isn't much to see on this unit except for the 10 range switches and the attenuator board, which has a burnt resistor on it, which has a note saying it's got a burnt resistor in finish. And with that resistor we're really getting into the nitty gritty of this particular unit because it's seen some better days. I actually grabbed this from work where this was had been sitting for quite a few years unused after we got it from another company which uh, had had it sitting around unused for quite some time and prior to that, probably talking about 15 years ago, they had been using it to, well, I don't even dare think about where because this thing is rusty and crusty all over and uh, it didn't work when I got it I never had tested it a few years ago and then it worked and it's been kind of on and off and this thing has been so hacked to smithereens by the previous owners that uh, it's quite a miracle that it's actually doing anything at all. The first thing I noticed when I brought it home was that uh, I got a free spare output transistor with it. 
serviceable status, unknown. And the more I looked into it, the more repairs or test points and bodge wires and post-service repairs I found. So at first when I got it, it actually wouldn't output anything sensible at all. It was not really responding to any controls and it was outputting a kind of rounded square-ish wave at about 400 kilohertz. And uh, someone had obviously been trying to tackle that issue before, since it was actually caused by a solder joint which had got bad, gone bad underneath this IC. And someone had been tracking it down to somewhere around here, and they'd absolutely butchered the IC and socket when taking it out and trying to troubleshoot it. And they'd tried repairing it and just failed. And. Uh, I finally managed to patch it together by soldering the IC to the socket and patching the trace underneath properly. And then I took off the underside. And I found bodges, and bodges, and reworked solder joints, and forgotten solder joints, and forgotten solder joints with bodges on them, and bodges where the pads have fallen off, and test points. The place is so battered with probe marks I can barely understand how they're still holding on. And something which I really hope isn't critical because it isn't there anymore. Oh, and did I forget to mention the lead going nowhere? I think this is number three. Mm, crusty. But despite all this... The unit actually works, and it's pretty damn well spot on. After 40 years of obvious abuse by the worst possible offender, a bad repair tech. And yes, those really are light bulbs. As for the physical outside of the unit, it's an all aluminium case with the very worn out blue sliding panels. We've got a 10 dial for frequency, megahertz, 3 for kilohertz, 3 for hertz and 3 for millihertz. One of, one of which has obviously been butchered at some time and uh, someone's put a reasonable knob there actually. Two outputs, set level, variable level, the attenuator actually works. And we've got a, a decibel attenuator situated there, which is obviously using the attenuator board in there, which, uh, whereas this one's just adjusting the gain of the output stage. And uh, this one works perfectly, it's additive, so you've got 1 decibel, 2 decibel, 3 decibel, 4 decibel, so it came up like a binary thing, except uh, instead of going to 16 it goes to 10. We've got the remote button which uh, disables the entire front panel, but uh, if you press the remote, it will actually stay on the last set frequency, which uh, should be a given since it's a digital thing, and the acquire board just uh, programs the DAC to perform a certain duty when you set the knob. And around the back, there really isn't too much going on either. We have the free outputs, which is a 1 MHz set output, uh, the variable output, which uh, I think this is just the same as the front panel, and a fixed output, which should also be the same as the front panel. We have the world's least efficient fan drill, a reference, one of his reference in the, uh, I suppose you could call it a GPIB header, where you can remote control the unit, and a fuse, 231 10 selector, and uh, a vastly more efficient fan grill for the input, which leads straight into the transformer. Now I must comment on why I I do not understand this. Was it bad enough that they chose to use a fan which had a motor diameter that's about three quarters of the entire fan size? Oh well, I suppose it did last for 40 years. And I really need to remark on the amount of rust in this thing. A very single surface which is able to corrode has corroded. So I'm suspecting that this thing was actually used to 
on a, a seafaring vessel, vessel, we have a few large ferries around here. So perhaps it came from one of those, because I really don't see how else we could have reached this level of decay, save for well, storing it very incorrectly or just dunking it into a lake for the sake of it. But hey, at least there's no contest about what material the fan blades are made out of. So after a rather lengthy and dire and ultimately futile cleaning effort, which uh, mostly led me to figure out that someone had used a rather cheap blue colour to paint this thing, perhaps we can finally take a bit of a more detailed look at its performance. And this thing is really severely ingrown with dirt, because you just have no way of getting it off. And I just really have no idea about what's going on with the top cover. So, we already established that uh, this thing is quite accurate still as far as frequency is concerned, and indeed, uh, as I've been playing around with it, I've simply not been able to make it say anything other than spot on according to this Rigol scope, so there really isn't much more to say about uh, the frequency except that it's uh, at least as accurate as this cheapo scope, which probably isn't really saying much. But uh, the other more remarkable things about this unit are its low frequency settings, and as you can see, you're looking at something rather low in frequency right now. Uh, it's actually set to the 1 millihertz setting right now, which is way out of range for all the frequency counters on the scope. And uh, we can just uh, select any frequency from 1 millihertz up to 2 megahertz. And as you can see, it resets to zero when you change range. So this is 10 millihertz, 20, 30, 100, one half of a hertz. So that is some subwoofer test for you, and uh, I can see that the, uh, the frequency count is kind of starting to catch up with us. There we go, one half of a hertz, 500 millihertz. The knobs are a bit worn on this thing. What about you? 900 millihertz. And the best thing is you can actually adjust it with the lower range controls at any stage. And we can create 1.001 hertz, which, uh, yeah, the frequency count is obviously not keeping up with. But this is actually 1.001 hertz, and we can do 1.005 hertz, 1.008 hertz, and we can even do higher frequencies at such resolution, which is really quite remarkable. And once we start getting up to the higher frequencies, this being 100 kilohertz, we can adjust the frequency so fine as to place it right between two steps on the frequency counter on the scope. The actual frequency being output being 100.002257 hertz. And if we just go on the finest control and put it up a bit. We're sitting steadily at 100.003 kHz. And if we move into the actual range of the frequency counter, we can just step one lead significant digit. No problems. But that's when things start to get a bit ugly and the early 70s digital design starts to rear its ugly head. Because for the same 100 kHz uh, output right now, now if we start to zoom into it quite a bit we are going to find quite a bit of stairs tapping going on. That's not particularly good looking. I think that this shows up best on the analog scope if we zoom in quite a bit on a lowest frequency waveform. This is a 1 kilohertz output and if we zoom right in we get to see the horror that is the stair stepping that is some quite major distortion on the waveform and uh, it's there because we simply do not have more than 10 bits of effective resolution on the output and uh, we can't do any super smooth filtering on it since we still have a 2.5 megahertz analog bandwidth so, the trade-off is that we end up with something like this, which uh, 
really doesn't look too good if you look too much into it. It almost looks as if this analog scope has pixels. So the next thing to do is obviously to connect to the distortion meter and uh, we'll start by taking a look at how it performs as an audio signal generator. Right now we're looking at it to just putting out a 10 hertz sine wave and uh, we've got the two low pass filters at 30 and 80 kilohertz uh, respectively enabled so as to remove any high frequency gibberish that uh, might be present in the output signal stuff that's pretty much irrelevant for audio use we're also using a signal level of uh, just about 3 volts RMS you can't see it but the level is set to 3 volts full scale so let's shoot it to distortion and we've got just about 0.37% distortion in this output signal. Since most of that noise is uh, stair-stepping from the DAC, which is not being removed by a low-frequency, low-pass filter, we should see a decrease in distortion as we move up in the frequency range. Now, keep in mind, we are using the low-pass filters, so once we move past a certain point it's going to start decreasing since we're cutting out harmonics as well but uh, for a couple of low frequencies just I guess we'll do a hundred and a thousand hertz too we'll get a bit of a look at how it performs at a low range the improved performance at higher frequencies uh, shouldn't really be apparent uh, anywhere below 10 kilohertz anyway so we'll step it up to a hundred hertz and we've got actually quite significantly low distortion. That's unexpected. We're at 0.29% or so. That's severely unexpected. Is it actually cutting at harmonics due to the 30? Yeah. It's actually cutting at harmonics at the 30 kilohertz mark already. So I guess we'll have to dump that filter right now and go for 80k and once removing that filter we're up to about 0.34% distortion actually no that can't be right because I know the 30 kilohertz filter doesn't do anything below 10 kilohertz so this Rockland 5100 actually seems to have a considerably better performance at uh, 100 hertz than it does at 10 hmm, curious anyway let's step up to 1 kilohertz the level is being extremely even, at least which you should, should expect since we're just uh, changing the frequency in a digital manner. The output stage amplifier should be really flat anyway. So let's swap over to distortion and uh, now you can see that the stair stepping is starting to become really quite obvious from the secondary camera. But uh, we're actually down to 0.21% THD plus noise, which is... Hmm, actually surprising again. I wasn't expecting it to perform that much better. And if we disengage the 30 kHz low pass filter, we can see that it just basically adds a whole lot of uh, ringing into the stair steppings waveform. And if we remove the 80 kHz as well, we just have lots and lots and lots of ringing going on there. But there really isn't much. Uh, harmonic distortion to speak of, not much at all, it's mostly just uh, a stair-stepping distortion really. Anyway, at this stage we'll just uh, permanently disengage those two filters, putting us up to about 0.4% distortion at uh, 1 kilohertz, and we'll check the higher frequency performance. Now this uh, meter only goes up to 100 kilohertz, and it's going to roll off quite quickly after that, but uh, we'll give it a go at 10 kilohertz for starters and a 10 kilohertz hour frequency response is still basically racer flat and the distortion hasn't dropped slightly we're down to 0.35 with both low pass filters disengaged at this, this is the stage at around which you would expect the distortion to start dropping since we are moving into the effective range of the low pass filter on the output of the digital to analog converter. So, the higher in frequency we go, the more smoothed out the stair stepping is going to be. So, if we move up to something like 50 kilohertz, we should see another drop. And we'll have 50 kilohertz there. 
and we have slightly lower distortion at about 0.32 percent well, let's just do the whole thing and go up to 100 kilohertz now there we have 100 kilohertz we seem to have slightly more output voltage at this stage but nothing really too remarkable point something of a decibel and curiously our distortion has gone back up to about 0.4 percent hmm Yep, that doesn't seem to be a measurement error. We do have 0.4% of this frequency again. Hmm. That's really odd. I would not have expected to see any kind of rise in distortion as you move up in frequency. And it really shouldn't be the distortion meter acting up either, since uh, it's going to just roll off at the frequencies much above this. And I'm quite certain there isn't going to be any low frequency gibberish in there. We might just enable the high pass filter, and indeed we have no 50 Hz hum or anything going on, which would have upset the other measurements, anyways. Oh, well, I suppose we do have a specification to reference for this kind of stuff. And the specification sheet states that uh, the spurious component and uh, harmonic components are. It's supposed to be minus 70 and minus 55 decibels respective, so the harmonic ones are uh, really going to dominate and we sh should be looking at uh, just under 55 decibels of uh, crap on the line and uh, even after taking some time to really optimize the testing setup and remove any sources of uh, signal corruption including the monitoring scope, uh, we can land at just about uh, minus 50 decibels of noise and harmonic distortion at 100 kilohertz so it might be slightly out of spec maybe but really uh, I, I would say that I'm happy with this and at 10 kilohertz we can just about breach the minus 50 decibel mark and since the specification actually is uh, for harmonic components up to 100 kilohertz being at minus 55 dB uh, and uh, once up to 500 kilohertz being at minus 50 and we have a meter with a bandwidth of 330 kilohertz here I would say that we are quite justified in doing that engaging the 80 kilohertz low pass filter observing the drastic difference it makes I mean now we're at uh, minus 57 decibels so that's definitely well 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 within spec and even beyond it so I, I would say that uh, this thing actually would perform up to spec at least in the low frequency range we don't really have the proper test gear to assess it and uh, just because we can here's what it sounds like when connected to a stereo and uh, thanks to Canon for providing an awesome high pass filter at 60 Hz you're not going to be able to hear any sweet bait frequencies generated by it so we'll start at a few tens of Hz But if we go really up close to a speaker and turn the volume way up high and feed a really low frequency signal into the amplifier, we can really hear the stair stepping.
and anything above a couple of hertz and we're actually within the frequency response of the amplifier and I didn't want to ruin the speaker so we'll cut it there. And I think that more or less sums it up for the Rockland or WaveTech Model 5100 uh, DDS signal generator and I hope you liked this uh, look into some properly vintage uh, digital signal generation gear and that means I finally get to turn that damn fan off. Beyond that though, I think uh, I think I'm actually going to replace the fan in this thing for something bearable and uh, probably install it in my gear rack because this is a properly useful unit. It might not have very good analog performance but uh, the frequency accuracy of it seems to be pretty much spot on and after about 40 years any long term aging of a crystal is going to be all done and accounted for. So I really expect this thing to be a very useful addition to the arsenal here in the lab. It's certainly a better standard than my old uh, 339A distortion meter which only goes up to 110 kHz and has no absolute frequency reference in it whatsoever. I don't even think it's got a body crystal. There's one thing left though. I think this unit has honed itself a nickname.